of one-dimensional collisions. Uh, these are both sort of different applications that I think are good to see how, you know, the questions can be blended in with other things that could happen, right? <clears throat> so, and specifically with conservation of energies, we're mixing in the same question conservation of energy and conservation of momentum, which is exactly what you do uh, with two dimensions, but in your Crokinole co lab. Okay, so we have... Imagine this is the situation, just picture it here. So you got some sort of pendulum, okay? You got a ball sitting down here at rest. And here we know we have a 26 centimeter piece of string in the middle. And I have A up here is dropped, it's released, okay? And when it drops, it runs into this lighter ball. And we want to find out after the collision, how fast is B going after the collision? But first we're looking for what is the speed of A just before the collision. Okay, so B sitting here, what's the speed of A when it drops down to here? Okay? So, you know, the first thing, there's no collision, so you just apply conservation of energy. And the information we have is we know the mass of it. We know it's, you know, this string is 26 centimeters. That means when it drops down to here, it's going to drop a length of 26 centimeters. That's the height difference from here to here. Even though it's coming across like that, it's still the height difference that concerns us. We know it's dropping, so it's starting at V1 of 0, and we want to know V2. So it's a pretty straightforward, actually, um, O and H2 is 0 because that's the bottom. It's a pretty straightforward conservation of energy question, part A, right? You just say my total energy at the start is my total energy at the end. There's no, we're given nothing about friction, so just assume there is none. And so my energy transformation is gravitational, for A becomes kinetic for A. Again, B is not part of this first part of the question. Okay, it's just A we're talking about. So, you take the equation and say my gravitational mgh1 is equal to 1 half mv2 squared, m's cancel, solve for v2. So we know that just before the collision, A is traveling at 2.26 meters per second, and that's a pretty reasonable number. It's, it's, so I'm going to check if it makes sense. Okay? Now, here's what I really want to know. I want to know, look at this, I have an elastic head-on collision, and I want to know the speed of B after that collision. It actually doesn't ask us about A. It's not asking us two things, but we're going to have to use the elastic formula to find it. Okay? So in part B, we have an elastic collision. Um, let's look at our data. We know uh, the masses. We know the initial uh, speed of A. We know the initial speed of B. They're looking for, really, we just want this one, but we're going to have to find both. It's not as simple as just saying, oh, maybe I don't have to use two equations, two unknowns, because you'll still have to, but we want to solve for B. And once again, just to get rid of the subscripts and make the question look a little clearer, I use uh, just A for VA2 and big B for BB2. Okay? So just looking at the formula. First formula, conservation of momentum. So this is just the collision. I'm not the dropping has nothing to do with it anymore. Okay, it's a new it's a new life, new world. So I take uh, the initial momentum of B. The the black ball is zero because it's just sitting there, right? And I know the, sp the speed or the velocity. We're gonna call. I guess I didn't do it, but I better. I better call. You know this direction, the direction of motion. We'll call that positive. Oopsie, not equals. It's positive. Okay, so uh, there's this, the velocity is positive number, and then afterwards I've got uh, ma va2, which is just 0.25a plus 0.21b. So I want to get, I'm going to get b by itself, do the same thing I did last time, right? To get b by itself, this time, um, you know, if I go this step and I divide everything by 0.21, that's how I got b by itself. So that's my first equation. And now I have my conservation of energy. And it kind of looks the same, right? But now i got squares everywhere. So this whole bit squared is 1.28, uh, 0.25a squared plus 0.21b squared. I'm going to apply substitution by substituting this in. Okay. And then again, it's an algebraic disaster. <laughs> 
algebra, 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 hopefully ending up with a quadratic formula. I'll let you write it out and maybe think it through as you go through, but all I'm doing is applying, is trying to get, try to get this in the form of the quadratic formula. Okay, so this whole step, you might want to pause now and write it all out. I'm not going to explain every step. I think that, you know, you could probably follow on your own what I'm doing. Hopefully you can, right? This is the squaring bit. This is distributing 0.21 through the whole thing and rearranging, ending up with 0 on one side and finding A, B, and C for the quadratic formula. Um, I'm going to, I showed you to use the website. You can do that on your own if you want to, but you should solve for A using the quadratic formula and you get 2.21 or 0.22. So now here, just a little food for thought, uh, I got 2.26 before. They're not the same. Did that mean I screwed up? What it means is that every single step in here I was rounding, right? So it's close to the same. If I'd gotten you know, 74 or negative 3 or something, then I would have to be concerned. But because I know I rounded throughout, I know you guys always, when you're doing your assignment, right, you say, is this okay? I'm off by, you know, on my second decimal place. Yeah, every time you round, you lose accuracy, right? So it's close. Um, but now, I'm, but that, what that tells me, though, is this is the solution I want, right? I want A equals 0 0.22. So I'm going to sub that into equation 1 to find B, and that's the answer I'm looking for, right? I only really wanted this one. That was the question. So, does it make sense? Well, B is lighter than A, so it kind of makes sense. It ends up going faster than A was on the collision, but I think it makes sense. So we're going to say they're both positive, which kind of makes sense too. They're both moving in the same direction afterwards. So, okay, we'll go with it. Okay, the next example, I love the next example. It's to me a great, well, first of all, it is very similar to the Crocono again. And it's a bit more realistic or something that you might actually use this for. So looking at actually an automobile collision, I chose Miss Hillary's accident. She did get rear-ended a couple years ago. Okay. And the two cars stuck together. And they traveled 12 meters before coming to a stop. So the question would be, she was obviously stopped when the collision happened. Was the guy who ran into her, was he speeding or not? That's the question. Right? And we can figure that out based on you know, where they fall, where they end up. So someone can easily look at the, uh, the sliding friction of their tires. Their tires probably didn't roll after the collision. They probably slid because the brakes were locked. You can tell by the skid marks, right? So skid marks were a length of 12 meters. And, and we know the you know, manufacturer could easily tell you what the, what the coefficient of friction on those tires is, right? So 0 0.6 would be a realistic thing that you could find out. So the police officer wants to say, was this guy speeding or not? Should I charge him with speeding or just with, you know, texting while driving and not running into, not running, not paying attention and running into poor Miss Hillary and her family? So just looking at the picture I drew, I think it's important in these questions because these are hard questions, right? And I've given this question on tests and exams before, and it's like it's really the same idea as the Crocono because you have to use friction and you have to use conservation of energy to figure out how fast the things were going. So what we know, well, we know the masses. We know she started at a stop, like she started without moving. And then after they, he ran into her, she definitely did move for a period of time. And then they came to a stop. It also looks like an inelastic collision, right? Because there's two things at the beginning and then they're stuck together at the end. So that we know. Um, the way that I treat this question, and... and yeah, it could be there's a different way to do it, but I'm not sure what that would be. The way that I treat it is I look at the final situation. I know this coefficient of friction. I know this distance. I use that to find the speed right after the collision, immediately after the collision. Because after that collision, their brakes were locked. They were sliding to a stop, right? So I can figure out that speed. And once, again, with my goal of finding out the speed of this kid before he ran into her, well, you could then say, okay, once I know the speed right after the collision, I can use conservation of momentum, totally inelastic collision, to find his speed beforehand. Okay? So a question like this, like a forensic type situation, you're working backwards. And again, that's exactly what you do in Crocono. So don't ask me. You should know. <laughs> you should know on your Crocono. Look at the chips where they land afterwards. Figure out the speed right after the collision. Use that to find the speed before the collision. Okay? Okay. 
So here's what I'm going to do then, is use conservation of energy, because after that collision, you've got the kinetic energy of them moving, and it turns all to heat through the locked tires, right? So I can use uh, EK equals E thermal. And then once you know that, then you go use conservation momentum. So it's a two-step problem. So let's look at the first step. I'm calling um, step two and step three. So like this is, this is one, this is two, and this is three, right? So I'm saying um, the data that I know is their combined speeds after is zero. No gravitational, no height difference, nothing at all. The delta D, which is the distance that they're sliding for, 12 meters, and we know the combined coefficient of friction. We know their combined mass is 2,200 kilograms, so that's the mass of the whole system, right? Um, and then let's look at the conservation of energy. So the total energy is 2 equals 3, after the collision equals when they stopped. Uh, you know, there's the full list, but really what's happening is kinetic energy is turning into heat. Right? So that means that EK2 equals E thermal, the heat loss due to friction. E thermal, um, in this case, there's you know nothing else going on, so Fn is equal to mg. Right? Then you got your mu k delta D. So solving for V2, I can just do that and find out that right after the collision, they're going about 12 meters per second. Okay? So we know the combined speed right after the collision. Pause it, but I'm going to move on. So now we look at the second part and say, okay, now I'm looking at conservation momentum. I'm going to jump here, so don't be angry. <laughs> so I know this speed now at, is 11.88. Now I can say, okay, I know that. I know this. I just need to find this conservation of momentum using a totally inelastic collision. So I know my V2. I know she's going zero to start. I know the masses, and I want to find VP1. So here's the formula for a totally inelastic collision. Sub in everything that you know, solving for the speed of the kid. So the kid was going 20.9 meters per second, uh, which works out two times 3.6, so 75 kilometers per hour. That was in the city, so the kid was speeding. Of course, I'm making up all the numbers. That's just the accident that happened. But let's assume that rotten kid was speeding, and, and uh, hopefully he pays a million dollars insurance for the rest of his life. <laughs> just kidding, but he was texting. Okay. That, so that's a super hard question. That's the end of uh, my sort of combined type questions, energy and momentum. And uh, yeah, that's it for now. One more lesson.